This administration, uh, this president, was uh, scoffed at for suggesting that we could have anything major done on a bipartisan basis, only to get that bipartisan infrastructure law done. So we're going to continue working with senators and their offices. There's a lot more good work to do. Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today I, like any child who saw the 2005 movie Madagascar, wish to inform you again and again and again that I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it. Why? Because it's Infrastructure Week here on G Zero, and I'm talking roads, I'm talking bridges, I'm talking tunnels, and to join me is Mr. Infrastructure, U.S. Secretary of Transportation. Pete Buttigieg, and I have been told that he too likes to move it, move it. Oh yes, he does. Okay, I'm done, I promise. But first, at 6.05 p.m. on a sweltering August evening in 2007, rush hour traffic was crawling across Minneapolis's I-35 bridge, and then the bridge began to shake. Everything you've got, the whole bridge over the river fell down. There's cars all over the place. We have construction workers, cars all over, and people in the water as well. 13 people died. 140 more were injured when Minnesota's third busiest bridge collapsed, plunging vehicles 10 stories down into the rushing Mississippi, and leaving one school bus with 63 children teetering against a guardrail. An NTSB investigation later attributed the collapse to 300 tons of construction materials that had been placed on a 40-year-old design flaw in the bridge's original construction. But while the flaw had gone undetected for decades, inspectors had raided the bridge in poor condition for 17 straight years. Done nothing about it. The accident shocked the nation, as well as the freshman senator from Minnesota. A bridge in America just shouldn't fall down. The truth is that bridges in America fall down all the time. In fact, since the 2007 Minneapolis disaster, at least 21 U.S. bridges have partially or entirely collapsed. A 2022 report found that 43,000 U.S. bridges are, quote, structurally deficient. The report also found that those same bridges are crossed 168 million times a day. At the current rate, it would take 30 years to fix all the country's structurally deficient bridges. You feel lucky? Globally, of course, the number of faulty bridges is much higher, but at least here in the United States, things may be starting to change. On November 6, 2021, Congress passed the Biden administration's $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, bipartisan support, which includes $550 billion for America's roads, bridges, mass transit, rail, airports, and ports. Secretary Pete Buttigieg has called it, quote, the single largest dedicated bridge investment since the construction of the interstate highway system. But as we all know, allocating the money is only half the battle. Making sure it's spent correctly is where the rubber meets the road. To talk bridges, tunnels, electric vehicles, and much more, I'm joined by the man himself, U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Secretary Pete Buttigieg, so glad to have you on the show. Well, thanks for having me on. So a lot of talk about. Uh, I thought I would start uh, with sort of the issue du jour du week, uh, the debt limit crisis. Uh, I, I've seen uh, former President Trump say uh, that he's fine with the default. And I know one of the sectors that would be most impacted is transportation infrastructure. So just wanted to give you a chance to opine on that. It's easy politically to go out there and say anything that isn't defense, any non-defense discretionary spending isn't that important and we ought to cut it. Until you look at what that actually means, and transportation's a great example. If you look at the House Republican budget framework that, uh, that they voted through and, and passed on the floor, if that were actually to carry the day, that would mean that we would have to stop our progress hiring air traffic controllers at the very moment when I think most Americans realize we need more, not less. In fact, there'd be no way to absorb those cuts without hundreds of air traffic control towers shutting down altogether. On railroad safety, something that rightly has a lot of attention in the US right now, uh, we would be in a situation where tens of thousands of miles of track fewer would be inspected every year for safety. There would be cuts to our capacity to manage hazardous material. Uh, and obviously, more generally, the, the impact on transportation at the very time when we're finally making the investments we've needed to make as a country uh, would take us in the wrong direction with 
damaging economic as well as safety consequences. So, you know, if you if you really want to slash everything that isn't the Pentagon, uh, you you got to be ready to own those positions. And I think it's very telling as we have gone out to talk to the American public uh, about what those cuts would mean, that none of these congressional Republicans who voted for those cuts have actually stepped forward to defend them and explain why air traffic control ought to be cut or why it's a good thing that you might have to wait a couple more hours in a security line at an airport because of the cuts to TSA. These are real impacts that are going to have a real effect on our everyday lives, not to mention on our economy. Now, I noticed that the first thing that you mentioned when I talked about uh, potential default uh, was air traffic control. And summer season is upon us. People are starting to travel uh, in greater numbers. And we've got 10 percent fewer air traffic controllers today than we had before the pandemic. W what does that mean, leaving aside any additional political challenges in terms of people that are just planning on flying. How are their experiences going to be different in that environment? So the good news is after a uh, very disruptive uh, year last year in terms of uh, the, the pace at which uh, air travel demand uh, returned and the struggles that the airlines had catching up, this year actually so far we've seen the performance quite strong. Each month so far in 2023, the preliminary data show cancellation rates under 2%. We actually haven't seen that happen every month this far into a year in many years. So that's the good news. But uh, it is going to be a challenge if we can't hire the air traffic controllers we need. Now, we got 1,500 uh, hired this year or, or in the process of being hired, another 1,800 in the president's budget for next year. And uh, even now, uh, we are facing the effect of the, the hole that COVID blew in our training pipeline because it can take more than a year, often closer to two years, to get an air traffic controller qualified for any particular position. But I do want to emphasize that uh, issues like staffing and air traffic control are not the main cause, not even close to being the main cause of cancellations and delays. We've been working with the airlines, pressing the airlines, and they have delivered a lot of improvements with what's the, under their control. Uh, and of course, we're continuing to work on what's under our control to deliver that smooth, safe, travel experience that passengers want, while also stepping up our consumer protection to support passengers when airlines aren't treating them the way they should. So we will always work with the airlines where appropriate, but we are also going to hold them accountable when they're not taking good care of passengers. That's what the latest announcement launching a rule about compensating passengers in extreme delays and cancellations is all about. We've also found that transparency goes a long way. Just by putting up a dashboard on our website at, at uh, flightrights.gov, uh, that had a remarkable effect. In a matter of days, it did what uh, uh, regulations could have taken years to deliver, which is going from none of the top 10 airlines to almost all of them, making specific written enforceable commitments about things like taking care of meals and accommodation and ground transportation and rebooking uh, if they're responsible for you getting stuck. A lot of passengers even today don't know, for example, uh, that an airline has to give you a cash refund if your flight gets canceled. And often the airline's sort of opening bid will be, well, how would you like a few thousand miles? And if a passenger doesn't know that that's the equivalent of 10 or 20 bucks, uh, they might really be shorted compared to that cash refund that, uh, that they are owed and deserve. And that's also why on the back end, we are going through thousands of complaints, uh, following up and uh, launching enforcement actions where appropriate. And all of this is about making sure that, that passengers have a better experience. Our number one priority with aviation is safety. And uh, we never take for granted the extraordinary safety record of U.S. aviation. Uh, but close behind it is customer service and making sure that we stand with passengers and have their back. So on, on the back of that, um, you know, talk about East Palestine in Ohio. Um, and uh, this this horrible crash. Uh, how much more have we learned uh, about the health implications for the community there? Well, this is something that uh, there's going to need to be sustained attention on for years. Uh, you know, the, the tests today, soil, air, and water uh, indicate that uh, that it is safe. But uh, years from now, you could see health effects. And so we need to make sure, and will as an administration, that these residents are taken care of. Uh, Norfolk Southern has to be accountable for the short-term and long-term consequences of their derailment. And I should note that uh, the EPA uh, has been doing uh, an enormous amount of work to hold them accountable. And then on the transportation side, we're working not just to make sure that they're accountable for safety issues, uh, but to make sure that the whole freight railroad sector 
does better. Now, bipartisan legislation has advanced in the Senate that would give us more tools to do that with. It would add teeth to our enforcement. It would uh, take time off of the long timeline that uh, the railroads were planning on getting these stronger tank cars that, uh, that would help prevent uh, some of these uh, uh, hazardous material incidents from happening. What we need to do now is make sure that the pressure and the attention is sustained, because often when an incident like this falls out of the headlines, then you see a pattern of water down or delaying rules and enforcement until the next terrible incident happens. And we, we shouldn't allow it to, uh, to go that way. So I was very encouraged by this bipartisan legislation. Uh, obviously needs to move in the House too and, uh, and get to the president's desk uh, in order for us to be able to enforce it. But we're going to continue to do everything we can with the powers that we already have uh, while calling on Congress to help equip us with the ability to do more. So a couple questions, bigger picture. Uh, you're joining me, I believe, from Detroit uh, and a major conference uh, that talks through U.S. and Asian uh, leadership, APEC. Um, and when I think about American policy over the last couple of years, industrial policy has been a big piece of it. It's been investing in critical infrastructure in the United States, but it's also been nearshoring, reshoring, not necessarily a lot of talk about globalization. How, how much is this a balancing act to ensure that we continue to have efficiency, broader global productivity growth? How, how much are we potentially cutting off our nose to spite our face um, if we're thinking about everything in the United States? Well, look, uh, I think two things are true at the same time in this administration, and it starts with the top, with President Biden. One is a very strong commitment to uh, making things in America, to rebuilding America's industrial base, uh, to uh, rebuilding American manufacturing jobs, and that's been a very successful policy so far with over 800,000 manufacturing jobs created. You can see that here in the industrial Midwest, in Detroit, where I'm sitting, in northern Indiana, where I grew up, and really across the region. But a second thing that is, of course, uh, also very very much a hallmark of, of President Biden is international cooperation, relationships, and renewing relationships that were put under enormous strain and pressure under the last administration. Uh, strong industrial policy does not have to mean isolation, and America uh, by America doesn't have to mean America alone. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, a lot of what you're seeing is not just uh, nearshoring and onshoring, but also uh, what uh, Secretary Yellen memorably calls friendshoring. And this uh, Asian Pacific economic Economic cooperation uh, summit is, is a great opportunity uh, for us to talk with friends and uh, uh, and then talk with economies that, that we have, have had more difficult relationships with about challenges that we all face. Uh, you know, nobody benefits, whatever the geopolitics, uh, nobody benefits from uh, uh, the destruction that comes by way of climate change. There are a lot of supply chain issues that it makes all the sense in the world for us to engage with various economies uh, uh, around the world on. And uh, what's unique about this Asia Pacific region, I think is the diversity of players here. We've got everybody from uh, uh, Canada. Later uh, uh, after this interview, I'll be uh, celebrating a binational EV corridor with my Canadian counterpart, uh, all the way through to uh, Chile and Australia and uh, the East Asian uh, economies that, uh, that have so much at stake in the future of the Pacific region. Uh, so this is absolutely the right time and the right place, I think, to uh, sail right into the complexities of believing passionately in creating more jobs right here at home in the US and recognizing the importance of these international relationships to get mutually important goals met. Now, there has been underinvestment structurally uh, of the United States, whether we're talking about semiconductors, we're talking about transition and uh, critical minerals uh, for uh, EVs, uh, whether we're talking about a lot of the core components of U.S. infrastructure. You've been very heavily focused on these issues for the last couple of years. Give me a quick prioritization. Where do you think the United States is most vulnerable because of that underinvestment? Well, well, we have to start by fixing what we have, our roads, our bridges, uh, our airports, uh, not exactly leading the world. And they need to be if we want our economy to continue leading uh, among the world's economies. And that's why you know, the proportions of the president's infrastructure law are historic, so that we can take care of uh, roads and bridges and trains and transit, uh, ports and airports, everything it takes to get people and, and goods moving around safely. And then there's uh, uh, what you just mentioned in terms of uh, sourcing critical minerals and materials related to the 
EV supply chain. This is hugely important, uh, and, and uh, there's nowhere uh, more uh, symbolic of its importance than, than where I'm sitting in Detroit, where uh, some of the most traditional and uh, uh, previously old school names in auto manufacturing are running into uh, EVs just as quickly as these newer firms, because it's clearly where the industry is going. And frankly, it's where the industry is going with or without us. So we have to act to make sure that America leads the way. So you give me solid minutes on infrastructure and transportation. I don't want to go cable news on you, but I got to ask you at least a few quick political questions, if that's OK. You know, it looks like we're heading to two pretty geriatric candidates uh, for 2024. Uh, you're on the other end of that spectrum. Should there be an age limit? Should we think about one for running for the presidency? No, look, uh, as the youngest member of the cabinet, what, what I see uh, is uh, uh, around that cabinet table is that I have the honor of being part of an extraordinary and extraordinarily diverse team led by an extraordinary president who has achieved more in two years and change than many would consider possible in eight years of, of, of service. I mean, historic achievements, advancing our economy, creating jobs, contending with the pandemic, dealing with the biggest land war in Europe since the Truman administration, uh, reinvigorating our industrial base, investing in semiconductors, uh, in uh, uh, energy uh, here in the US, delivering a, an infrastructure investment that has escaped previous presidents and previous Congresses, uh, just achievement after achievement, any one of which would be considered something that would define an era under normal presidencies. And I think that the measure of, of, of any administration is what it delivers. And we're going to keep pushing because there's more to do, which is why the president's always uh, pressing, uh, uh, pressing us in the administration and pressing the case publicly to finish the job. So uh, respectfully, the results and the facilities of uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein have not quite been that. Uh, should she resign? Look, it's, it's not my place to, to make those kinds of calls. What I'll say is that we work with every senator from every state and from both parties to get stuff done. And by the way, speaking of administration accomplishments, uh, you know, this administration, uh, this president was uh, scoffed at for suggesting that we could have anything major done on a bipartisan basis only to get that bipartisan infrastructure law done. So we're going to continue working with senators and their offices. There's, there's a lot more good work to do. Okay, so less than full-throated, she should stick around uh, on that one. Okay, another one. This is about you, so you can make a call. You just, if I understand correctly, just changed your permanent address to Michigan. And I'm wondering, uh, that's where you're joining me from right now, does that have anything to do with the possible open Senate seat going forward? So there are uh, two major reasons for, for the uh, uh, move to Michigan. Uh, their names are Joseph and Penelope. They're our twins, our uh, son and our daughter. Uh, and uh, uh, ever since they came on the scene, uh, we've seen how important uh, tr uh, Chaston's uh, Traverse City home has been. And uh, they're close to their uh, grandparents. As a matter of fact, uh, right now with uh, Chaston traveling on a book tour, me here uh, in, in Detroit, uh, they're uh, in the, uh, thankfully, in, in, in the loving hands of their grandparents right now. Um, it's been the right choice for our family. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll always remember where I came from, but uh, Michigan has embraced us warmly too. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. And, and uh, look, the, the, the last thing I'm thinking about right now is any job besides the one I've got. I know that's probably what I'm supposed to say, but also if you just consider- that definitely what, what our... you're supposed to say. I would tell yeah, you to also, say Yeah, but also like, Pete. look at what's on our plate. Look at what the president has asked this department to deliver. That's taken about 110% uh, of my energy and attention, and the other 120% belongs to our family and our kids. Uh, last thing I wanted to ask you, you're the first cabinet secretary, I was shocked to learn this, that's ever taken parental leave. Uh, lessons from that uh, for other senior government officials and private sector uh, executives? Well, uh, look, uh, um, I'm glad I did it, and I'm, I'm glad that I had uh, uh, the support of, of my boss in this administration to take care of my family. Uh, our circumstance was a little unusual. Uh, the circumstances of our adoption, we, we got a phone call, and the next day we were parents to newborn premature uh, infant twins. Uh, but whatever the circumstances are that, that allow you to uh, expand your family and become a parent, you, you need to have that time, uh, not just for uh, uh, connecting with, with, with your child, but just for uh, adjusting your life and, and uh, uh, for supporting uh, uh, your spouse. That was certainly a very important part of how Chas and I were taking care of each other is having the time to do it. And this is something that every American ought to have. You know, even the most senior private sector and government officials will find uh, that uh, in a well-run organization, uh, you should have the policy and the means to be able to uh, step 
uh, over to take care of your family when that is the right thing to do uh, and return to the office ready to do your job with a whole new perspective. Secretary Pete Buttigieg, thanks so much for joining me on G Zero World. Thanks for having me on. Take care. That's our show this week. Come back next week. If you like what you see, or even if you don't, you're like, wait a second, all infrastructure, no Eurovision? Take a minute to sign up for our most excellent morning newsletter. It's called G Zero Daily.